Welcome to our live Q&A. We do this every Thursday night. Tonight, our discussion will be a book discussion on the One Straw Revolution. And then we are going to open it up for general questions and answers about stuff. Here are the nine ways that I help people grow food. So tonight, we're going to make this fun. We're going to see how fast I can say this without mispronouncing a word. All right. Somebody say go. I have a YouTube channel. I have a weekly Q&A Zoom meeting on Thursday nights at 7 Pacific time. I have a Patreon channel. Go there, pay me lots of money, and I get rich. I'm a laboratory to do soil tests. I do a George Excludum 17 weeks. I do three-day boot camps. I'm available for consulting. I have a book called Worry for Eating. You can buy that somewhere. Um, newsletter, enter your email on my website, www.georgicrevolution.com. Next slide. Bam, that was fun. Okay, so spring boot camp is coming up. This is very exciting and important. This is a three-day class of how to grow food. I do these three or four times a year. Tell your friends and family about this. This is April 25, 26, 27, so it's right around the corner. You can come here to my greenhouse, my house, and I feed you fun food that we grow here on the ranch, and we teach you how to grow the food for three days. It's pretty awesome. The summer class is coming up. May 20th is when it starts. Move-in day is on Saturday, two days before that. Get that on your calendar so you can come here. But here's what that class teaches. It teaches people how to make money at farming by studying principles of uh, business and self-validation, understanding who we are and what our gifts and talents are. We learn ecological literacy. We learn all about the four ecological processes. Most people don't know what that is. I bet if we asked a thousand people on the streets of a big city where there's lots of people and we said, what are the four ecological processes? I would bet one dollar that out of a thousand people, nobody knows because because we're ecologically liter illiterate and we need to learn. We build great citizens. We understand how to have the best yields from our land. We restore deserts into grasslands and forests like they can be. And Mother Nature does that all the time, but I teach people how to make that happen. So it is pretty awesome. So th these are the things that we learn and study in our summer class. We had a fun class this week. I just invited a friend out here, and we made herbal things. We made uh, – we took alcohol and poured it over these herbs that we grew here on the ranch this last year. So in our 17 week last year, we harvested herbs, and I had those. They smelled good when we opened the bags. It was so much fun. And then we put um, alcohol over some of them, and we put olive oil over some of them, and we put castor oil on some of them. And then we made a salve, which was pretty awesome too. So this was fun. So I've never really done this before, and we are adding this into our curriculum for our summer class. So this is pretty neat to be able to learn um, all about this stuff. So I've been studying herbs all my life. I've used herbs for stuff all my life. Uh, but I got a professional in here to learn. Uh, Becca and Abby were both here for that. And so that was brilliantly awesome uh, because we were able to just like actually learn how to do it from a pro who has done it. So anyway, that was good. So book for next week is going to be As a Man Thinketh. This one is on like Audible and other places that you can listen to it. You can listen to this one fast. It's like maybe an hour or something. It goes really quick. So what I like to do when I listen to this book, I, when I'm working in the greenhouse someday and I just have my phone and I'm listening while I'm working because I'll work for a couple hours uh, at a time, <clears throat> excuse me, at a time. And so I will quite often just listen to this book twice in a row. And so that's a fun thing to do. So if you want to do that, you could do that. If you're on a road trip that's five hours long, you could listen to this like four or five times. If you put it on double speed, you could listen to it like 20 times in a full day, which might be nuts. But, you know, that's the way I live my life, so it's super fun. Tonight, let's get into our book discussion. The One Star Revolution by Masanobu. Does anybody um, speak uh, Japanese? Anybody? Maybe. You might know how to, to pronounce this. I can't pronounce it. Masanobo Fukuoka. <laughs> I probably said it totally wrong. So I'm going to stop my screen share real quick, and we can open this back up and look at it. These are my notes. Last time I went first, 
This time, I'm just going to start – let's just talk to people here. And we can just talk about if you guys – um, like if, if you read the book. If you didn't, it's fine. But if you did read the book and you want to share something, don't be shy. You can unmute right now and you can say something about this book. Tell me what you hated about it. Tell me what was false about it. Tell me what you loved about it. Tell me things that – whatever, anything, and we'll have discussions because maybe I hated this book, right? And that's why I shared it. I actually didn't. I love this book, and I really think that most of it is pretty accurate. So uh, unmute anybody if you want. Even if you didn't read it, you can unmute and say, hey, how you doing? I have a quick thought about it. Thank you, Ezekiel. Go for it. So it's cool because it's more than just like a manual or something, because a lot of books that are like this just come across as manuals saying do A, do B, do C. This one, though, it, it, it's honestly more of a philosophical treatise that questions the fundamental principles of modern society's relationship with nature. Uh, and honestly, it's pretty like I know that there were other things before it that we probably should be calling foundational texts and regenerative agriculture. But this is a major foundation stone in the movement and uh, was published when, you know, the, all this stuff was really cutting edge. And just it wasn't because now, you know, we have examples of people who've made it big doing stuff. There's the Gabe Browns and the Joel Salatins. But uh, when he was publishing this, you couldn't just pull up people who proved that it was economically viable. And he was doing it before we have a lot of the technology we have a benefit of now, you know, uh, and, and so it's just, it's just, it was very forward thinking for its time. And most of the things that it gets that, that I think are a little like iffy, uh, most of those just we've corrected now with more understanding of better technology and frankly, better microscopes. <laughs> okay, fantastic points. Yeah. Yeah, that was a big part of the book. I love it. Thank you for sharing. All right, somebody else unmute and say, how was your day? Um, Something that I liked about it was how uh, the perspectives part on about the book, like near the end. Um, I like how he said, like, you kind of want a perspective, kind of like a new baby towards things, kind of like thing. You don't have to know all the functions of each thing to have a respect and like, feel really good about each thing you see like you, you can know about the molecules but you don't have to know about the molecules to be grateful for your farm he's like saying i really like that part of it nice nice thank you michael that's right good stuff thank you <clears throat> all right who's the next unshy person I guess I'll, I will say I, I listened to this very last minute on two times speed. Nice. And, um, <laughs> I didn't get like the last five minutes of it. Yeah. Don't, don't feel bad about that, man. No apologies here. That's great. But I thought I, I and so I think there's a lot of stuff that I missed that I'd like to go back and listen to, because I think a lot of it was there. There's a good amount of stuff that's just knowledge for farming, um, that yeah. is advice on how to farm. But then there's there are there are different commentaries on like different ways of natural farming or ways that people say are natural farming but they're not and then how like in japan at the time like people would um they were kind of in favor of or people still are very much in favor of using using lots of chemicals um because it helps with mass production and it seem people say that it's easier um but it it's cool to hear i guess without any idea of how it actually works um that it 
does not in fact have to be harder to do natural farming and that um, it really is just working with the earth and helping the earth do what the earth does best to produce what you want it to produce and um, that there really isn't a lot of manipulation necessary in order to uh, produce lots of amazing food and growth and a good environment for a farm. Yeah. All right. Thank you for sharing what you got out of the book. That's great, Maury. Okay, we got uh, Brenly, Abby, Peter. Do you want to be shy? I can share. I have so many notes, though. I don't even know what to share. I really, really liked the book. Um, nice. He, this is amazing. I love that he taught Nodal not only like how simple gardening can be. I, t I learned more about gardening in his book than I've ever learned in my whole life. I just love how he made it sound so simple and that we overcomplicate things. But I also love that he dug so deep as to make it almost like Ezekiel said, more philosophical that it goes so much deeper into just gardening, um, more than just gardening. I think some of my favorite parts or favorite messages, I guess, was that he's trying to teach us how to get over our fixation on, on control and perfection. He's trying to get us to move beyond ourselves and to truly connect with, with God and with the earth and, and with ourselves and that we don't need this visual order we don't need this perfect system and i think that was his yeah his main message was that like i said we overcomplicate things and the simpler the better and simplicity is where we're going to get the best results because we're allowing the earth to do its thing because it knows what it's doing <laughs> um like i said i took so many notes i really really enjoyed the book a lot um and it's one i want to read again almost when i get there in the summer because I want to be able to garden in the same way that he does because I am someone that I, I have a little bit of a perfectionist mindset so I loved all the things he taught and I want to apply it to to what I do so yeah nice nice okay um let I want to interject something here so from what you guys have been saying I'm having a I'm having a thought process and so before I, we Talk to Peter and Abby. Let's just uh, let me just spit this out real quick. So I I think we're gonna do this probably maybe the first second third day of class. And I haven't written this down, so somebody needs to remind me. Maybe Abby can take notes. Uh, let's drive up on the mountain somewhere, like really soon. Maybe even on move-in day if not nobody's doing anything. We just go up there. And we'll take you to one of the most productive spots on the ranch, okay? So remember, this ranch is 20,000 acres, all right? So it's big. It's really big. And it's in two sections. The section where you'll be living is uh, 2,500 acres. So it's, it's the smaller part, but 2,500 acres, still pretty big. So here's the thing. There's a spot here. And when the Alan Savory people come out here and they test the the land, they like we call it monitoring. So they monitor the land to see how it changes every year. And then that goes in a worldwide database because they do these tests all over the world. And then we can see what land is doing um, around the world. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, but if we went up there and looked at it, then you could see what the natural world can do and what it can grow. So that's our most productive spot. And it, it's scoring like a 70 right now. And that's pretty good. But here's the thing. I've eaten food from up there. So it's interesting. In this book, he says, you don't have to grow everything like, like, like food, things that we call food. We don't have to grow everything. Because if you walk out into nature, there's all kinds of food out there. We just have to know what food is. But modern people, if we took them out there, they starve to death because they don't know what food is. In the early settlement of the United States, you know, like 18, 1800s, uh, people were making a mass migration from the eastern United States to the western United States. There were lots of groups who did that. 
uh, there were the 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 Forty Niners Gold Rush going to uh, California. There was the Oregon Trail, everybody going to the or Oregon, you know. Um, there was the Yukon Gold Rush, everybody going way up into Alaska. Um, there were the Mormon pioneers who crossed the plains. So there were all these migrant groups um, who who went. There were a whole bunch more, but those were some of the big ones that we can read about in history. And a lot of those people struggled if they went in the winter or if there were early snows or late snows, they'd be in trouble. And sometimes people ran out of food and they, and they suffered starvation. The interesting thing is people have lived on this continent for who knows how long. Nobody really knows exactly how long people have lived here. Let's just say thousands of years to be safe. And there's been societies who don't starve to death because they know what food is. The tragedy of the early um, settlers in the 1800s is they didn't know what food looked like and they didn't know how to get it. And so that's an interesting thing to think about. But in this book, he talks about all the different foods that were just growing wild. We'll just go here and get this and go there and get that. And so we can actually do that on like the first week of class if you guys want to. I think we're going to add that into our curriculum because it's very much about what this book is about. So let's just show you what productive land looks like. Now realize that we're, uh, we're it's going to be called there could still be snow here at that time of year. So the food won't really be growing yet, a lot of it. But throughout the summer, we can return to that place as much as you want. You can walk up there anytime. It's not very far from right here where we live. And you can see things. But in the summer last year, I was eating probably five different foods from that little area because there, there are wild berries that are there. There's grasses that are there. There's edible plants. There's, there's medicinal herbs. There's equisetum. There's uh, like all kinds of things I'm not even thinking of, like rose hips in the fall when the roses are, are ready. You would pick the rose hips, you know, a fantastic herb. So there's all these different edibles that grow. And uh, wild onions, we dug some wild onions last year and ate them. So there's all kinds of food. But uh, anyway, I just wanted to interject that before uh, because I might forget. But that's just a super fun thing. That went along with this this book. Um, I got people with bad internet connections here. I'm gonna let them back in. Okay, hey, Abigail, Peter, what do you have to share tonight? Thanks. That was a good idea. I'm excited. Um, so I kind of had a crazy week. I didn't get all the way through the book, but I did get through the first couple chapters, and I really liked his approach. Um. I think it was a very holistic, um, kind of like Zeke was saying, he's saying there's more philosophy. I think there he was stepping into a zone of looking at a bigger picture and trying to help us see that maybe what we assume isn't the only way, like what we first think. And I think it's really good for us to 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 ask ourselves kind of like i think michael was saying something about um how he said we should be like a baby in our mindset or when we approach things um at the beginning to like just start fresh and not assume that we know everything because a lot of times there's this thing called confirmation bias and we can miss things because we assume that we know we assume that we understand it already and then because of that we miss it that's not being mindful because when we're mindful we can see what's there and we see it for what it is instead of assuming we know everything about it and so I think it's a really good perspective to take in everything in our life but especially gardening especially nature because nature is sending us messages all the time the garden will be talking to you the the animals the the plants they tell you what they need they they help you understand what you need it's amazing like I know it kind of sounds weird, but I believe in, in a way the soil teaches you by talking to you and helping you learn about yourself. And so if we're mindful and we kind of go about it as like a little child, like we're learning, everything's new and exciting. And we're like, we're trying to take, soak it all in and not miss details. Then I think we'll be able to develop a more complete view. And I think that's what a holistic mindset is all about when you combine holistic and mindfulness 
So I appreciated his first couple books, uh, chapters. I'm excited to read the rest of it. Um, but thanks for all your thoughts, guys. That was really cool. Thank you, Abby. That's awesome. That Peter, do you have any words for us tonight? Um, I did not read the book. I have been slacking this week. That's all right. Um, You're a working man. You're earning money. It's okay. No, no, <laughs> sir. No I did problem. have one thought, though. So, I don't know if this is what he, like, talked about or mentioned in the book, but I was just thinking about this as everybody was talking. I think there's a lot that you can learn when you work with the land and not just like, not just necessarily like about the land itself or yourself, but I think when you, when you work the land correctly, I think you come to know God because it it makes me think of the scripture, all things denote there is a God. And I think when you are in nature, when you're working with it in its rawest form, you come to know God in a very real sense and i think it's through that process of coming to know god that you find yourself and you learn about everything else because it's all connected to him so that was just the thought i was thinking nice nice peter and he actually does say th something very similar to that in the book i'm going to go ahead and share my screen here and pull up my notes because okay we're on that slide right here so hopefully you can see that maybe uh it's at the very bottom in red and it's in chapter 29 of the book, and it says the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the growing of humans. And I can't even see this because it's kind of messed up. Hold on. My, com my computer is weird. There, now I can read it. Um, the ultimate goal of farming is not the growing of crops, but the growing and perfection of human beings. And that is the entire point of the Georgic tradition. That's so why I call this the Georgic schoolroom. Remember, Georgics means to work the earth, to, to bring something forth. And, and it's a very Western-type tradition, but this is an Eastern book with an Eastern philosophy. You can't get much more Eastern than Japan, where this book was thought up and written and practiced. And they came to the same conclusion, which is pretty awesome. So... I mean, it's it's great. So farming, yeah. I mean, we need we need some farming. We need some food production so that we have a society, so that we have a culture, so that we can do something and we're not just running around hunting and gathering. And I mean, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. But our society, I I just kind of think it's good the way it is. I mean, there are problems, but it's good that we have a place where you can go and buy some food. A grocery store is a good thing. Uh, the thing I don't like about it is you can't find any good food there nowadays. <laughs> but what if we had a grocery store that had the best quality food ever? It's a good thing to have that. Uh, but the better thing is that through the process of growing food, we perfect human beings. And, and that is an interesting thought. I'm going to stop my share so that I can see you guys again. But um, But anyway... So, yeah, thank you for that comment, Peter, because the book it brings that out very much. We become better, better people. Okay, Esther, Vernie, uh, and uh, Becca, you guys are together. Did you have any thoughts you wanted to share about this subject tonight? We're going to let Becca take yeah, the uh, lead on this. Thoughts. <laughs> she might not like that. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. No, Somebody she did. Share. She volunteered. <laughs> nice. Can you hear me? Um, no, get closer to that phone. I think okay. I think it might be up here where it hears so let me click it so it so it hears from the phone. Hang on a second. Uh, I'm gonna change okay, can you hear a little better Maybe? Okay, how about now? Yeah, that's great, Becca. Go ahead. Okay. So there was a specific moment in the book where he was talking about um, planting seeds and how he was so frustrated because he would plant seeds and the crows would come behind them, behind him and eat them. Like before he even got the whole row in the ground and he tried all of these different things and he was so frustrated. And finally, the thing that he figured out was to uh, plant the seeds 
while other things were growing. And so there were other species of whatever growing in the field. And then that's when he planted his seeds and he didn't have a problem with the crows eating them. And I really like hearing different ideas like that because I think it's so creative because there's a problem and I don't know how long he had it for, but sometimes we have problems like that. And we are like, there must be a better way to do this. Like there just got to be a way to solve this problem. So I just thought it was so cool because there are, there are ways to work with mother nature and what she already does to accomplish things and it's kind of like sometimes I feel like you have to like think outside of the box or like just think of something a little bit differently than the way that it's traditionally done and so there were a couple things like that throughout the book where he just had different methods and things that he figured out and so I thought that was really amazing yeah nice thank you Becca that's awesome Esther, Verney, did you guys have anything to say? Hey, I have something I was thinking. So I didn't read the book either, but I was just thinking, I like what Peter was saying too, just about like the whole being connected with the land thing. I think that's such an important thing, just, I don't know, and it's something that I think a lot of people, like it's becoming a little more popular, people are like realizing, oh yeah, we should have a connection with the land. <laughs> but um it's just, it's such an important thing that I think we all need to have is having that connection. Like, I don't know, because like at my job, I'm inside all day and I never like, I can't like, I don't have time to go outside, but it's so nice to just go home and like, I don't know, be able to have like, the greenhouse and places where you can just go like feel connected with the land because it's such an important part of like human history that we've kind of lost in today's society. And it's something that we really need to like strive for and reach for. And it's just so important. Yeah, nice. I, I have something to add to this. I too, and I apologize, I have not read this book, although I have heard William discuss it at length. It, but it's, okay. it's okay, Verna. You've read more books than most humans. So <laughs> I think what you say will be valid. <laughs> but there's 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 kind of a there's kind of a thread here through a lot of the commentary that is um, consistent with this idea that you find in, in multiple areas of life, multiple philosophies. And it's, it was summed up beautifully by Joseph Campbell, um, who, who talked about the, uh, the hero's way, um, a way of um, kind of a, a, based on the psychology of Carl Jung, a Jungian look at life, based on the idea, in his quote, he said, um, it's it's pointless to ask of life what the purpose is when you are the purpose. And um and I and I listen to the commentaries here. The purpose of farming, of working with the soil, um, it isn't just about the crop or an artist. It's not just about the painting uh, or anything we do. It's not it's not just the product of our efforts. It's the fact that being fully engaged as a human being in the living world is who we are and what we're supposed to do we're supposed to be fully engaged with life and and this this commentary that i've seen from everybody is like everybody is is moving into embracing and understanding that space that that being fully human is choosing to be engaged with the earth because this is our home this is what we do as human beings. We we care for the earth. We are involved with the earth. We are a part of the process of life because we are part of the purpose of that life. And I, I love it. I, I, I need to read it because uh, so much of what I've heard really mimics that philosophy, which is found in, in lots of different works. Um, you know, uh, Eckhart, Tolle, Eckhart Tolle talks about it too. It's like um, life is the dancer, but you are the dance. Like were the point you know of of the effort here and and being fully engaged is is our purpose anyway those were just my thoughts something else i want to say I, that's so good Bernie. i love that that's that's awesome 
that got me thinking just like I don't know like that whole the there was that talk that oh, I forget who was who gave it but it was about like the whole God is the gardener thing um Hubby Brown God is the gardener and it got me thinking about that like being connected with the earth it helps us be connected with God and see that like I don't know like when we farm we're like farming the earth and like I don't know just like God is the real farmer. He farms the souls, and like we are, we are the greatest crop that there ever could be. I don't know. I was just thinking about that. I was I was writing a book today. I was working on one of my books today when I was um just at work, and I was I was thinking about that all day today, and I thought it tied in really good. Yeah, beautiful. Those are great, great thoughts. Good job, guys. That's good. That Esther, that would have been Hubie Brown that you're referring to. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. Good, good thoughts. Anybody else? Anybody who's everybody's gone like they've talked so far. Does anybody else have anything else you want to share? Because you certain, certainly can. But nobody has to. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, oh, sorry. Here, you want? <laughs> I can mute yeah, myself. If you want to go first? Oh, uh, okay. Mari, <laughs> let's. Well, I'm gonna pick Mari, and then. Oh, okay. Um. Well, the thing is, like, I was actually just kind of going for it because I know that there were a few thoughts that I I had had while people were talking, and um. Uh, something that Becca said made me think. about I guess I'm trying to like bring it back to my have it come back to me so that's why I was just kind of going for it and maybe encouraging them to go first <laughs> <laughs> um yeah I think maybe I'll bring it up again once once it's actually come to me because okay <laughs> good yeah <laughs> so um Esther or or Becca or somebody did you have something else to say Yes. Oh. Um. So I was. Um. We got on a little late, but did you guys already talk about uh, like rice and how it's grown and stuff? No, we didn't talk about that part. Okay, so I'm actually curious. I was listening to it and I missed some of it. Um, and I don't know if he actually like explained rice. I think he did a bit because he did stuff different than the other people who are growing rice. But can you explain like the process of growing rice and why they flood the fields and stuff and what he does differently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so in the book, he was just saying that they, you know, you don't need to grow the rice with flooding the fields. The fields go anaerobic. And then you have more problems with um, pests and disease in the rice when you're doing that. He said, let's just grow rice with other plants, and then you have less pests and disease. The fascinating thing about that, he figured this out. This book was published. I forgot the copyright date, and I don't have it in front of me. But I think it was like in 74. It was somewhere around the year I was born. So it was in the 1970s. The, we didn't discover secondary metabolites. And um, the, having to have four plant families until, until, like, it's been in the last 10 years when we have really understood that. And you can study the work of Dr. Christine Jones from Australia. She's a plant pathologist. And, and, and there's a lot of other doctors' work who has gone into that research. It took a whole group of people to figure it out. And I know I'm saying all these science words, and you don't need to worry about that. But the fact is, farmers have known... how to grow food without uh, uh, like serious problems for a long time because of trial and error. And now science is now catching up to tell us why. And so here in the Georgic School Room, we tell you the why of the latest, newest things. But farmers have been doing this forever. I don't know that that answered your question, Becca, but I talked about the exciting part that you brought up in my mind. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, did that was that did that have anything to do with what you were asking? <laughs> um, yeah, it was. Wait, so why why do they traditionally flood the fields of rice? Uh, it controls weeds. It's weed control. 
Okay. Really? So they don't actually need to be flooded? Uh, well, there's different types of rice. There's there's the rice that does grow in uh, patties a little bit better because they're like a land race rice, right? And so they've been growing that way for so many generations that, yeah, it's better. But there's also a, a, a kind of rice called upland rice. Most of the California rice is upland rice. I'm not an expert on rice. I could be telling lies right now. But as far as I understand it, um, that's, you know, yeah. And then when you go in to harvest the rice, you uh, you just, you know, you flood, the, you drain the fields and then you take a machine in there and drive on the fields and harvest the rice. But there's all kinds of rice. There's like thousands of varieties of rice out there nowadays. So... <clears throat> So oh, well, he doesn't flood his fields. Yeah, that's what he or said. He... But yeah, he said it's easier to grow rice without doing it, and it's more nutritious. It's more, uh, it, like it's better in all these different ways. That was the, his argument in the book, which was interesting. And yeah. didn't he say he did something different to control the weeds, like having other plants grow with it too, or something? Yeah, yeah, I I don't remember that detail. I've only read the book five times, so I don't have all the details memorized yet. <laughs> You've only read it five times. <laughs> yeah, I went through it once this week, but before that it was, I went through it twice last winter and then a couple of times before that. So I think this was the fifth time, actually. So I wasn't joking, but... <laughs> And the other thing about the rice, I didn't actually remember, um, like, I, I wasn't hanging those hooks in my head to really remember exactly about the rice, because I'm not planning on growing rice in the mountains of Nevada. <laughs> I don't think we could, even if we had to. Okay, good, good, comments, good discussion. What else, Becca? Keep going. So his main thing with not flooding the field was to um, not let it go anaerobic <laughs> and like have the plants be healthier. You know, we would have to go back and look at for that detail and see what his main point was. But I do know that um, in, anywhere that you have standing water, it does go anaerobic. So all those rice fields out there are anaerobic. And so you were not going to have a lot of other plants growing. You'd have very few. Um, so, yeah. Does that mean that, sorry, I have a question. <laughs> does, does that mean that, um, that rice is less nutritious because it's anaerobic or do the anaerobic microbes, can they produce the same amount of nutrition as the aerobic ones? Oh, that's a fascinating concept. And I, I don't have the answer for that, but like, I are know you kind that of we have stressed often that anaerobes are bad. And they actually are not. Think about our own bodies and our own digestive systems. All of the really good uh, bacteria and all that stuff that's in our digestive system to digest our food so we get nutrients, it's all anaerobic. So anaerobic is fantastic within context. The reason I'm always saying you don't want the anaerobes is because I'm talking about making compost. You want the aerobes. By the way, for those... That makes people, sense. Th th these words... Aerobic means oxygen. Anaerobes means no oxygen. That, that's all it means. So, so. I have a follow-up question. Are you, or I guess a clarification. You're saying that, like, anaerobic bacteria is a negative thing in the greenhouse because the plants we want to grow need aerobic microbes. Yeah. And yep. they need oxygen. Yeah. Okay, so it's just a context thing. Yeah. And it's a safety mm -hmm. thing. Because, uh, like, diseases that kill people and most plants live in anaerobic conditions. So let's name some of them. That would be um, E. coli, Schlegella. Um, who, knows, who knows a disease? Say a disease, quick. Um, What's a disease like E. coli? Um, salmonella. Those, these are these are creatures that live in anaerobic conditions. So if your compost that you're putting on your garden is filled with all these bad creatures, you might get sick from eating some food. But if you have a a a, a garden that is thriving with so many aerobes, meaning oxygenated uh, good guys, 
then you're not going to have the anaerobes there because you don't have an anaerobic condition, so they can't live there. So you have a very safe garden. So you can take a spoon and a fork out and eat your, your beets and your turnips and your carrots and anything you pull out without washing them at all or cooking them to kill any anaerobes, and it's probably going to be really good for you. Even though they're covered with all kinds of germs, but that'd be the good germs, right? I think it would be cool to research and see what the nutritional difference between plants that were grown in anaerobic conditions and plants that were grown in aerobic conditions. Yeah, that would. We need more people getting master's and doctor's degrees and all this research that hasn't been done. Although somebody's probably already done that one because that sounds like a really common question somebody could ask. We just need to do the research and find it. Okay, this has been a great uh, discussion. Does anybody else have a comment or a question about the book, One Straw Revolution? Um, and if not, we can open it up for garden and question answers. Um, so I I remembered what had uh, left Good. Go mind. for it, Mari. Um, basically, I, I was thinking about how, I, I mean, so I, I don't know how to say the name because I'm not reading it right now. Uh, but the author, he's this amazing farmer, um, who has like learned so much through personal experience, lots of personal trial and error of lots of different stuff, and now can teach lots of students who just come and just come to the mountains a lot of the time. And they're like, Hey, teach me how to do what you do. Um, and, or, you know, I don't know exactly when this was. So maybe, maybe this is all in the past, not happening anymore, probably. Um, but uh, it's really interesting because um, as I was kind of, the thought crossed my mind that like, oh, it's so great that like he went, you know, he went through all the trouble and, you know, had, kind of experienced all of the um the trials of this and now we just kind of get to consume the knowledge that he he um came to through his own creativity and and having to deal with these issues over and over again um but then i was realizing like wait this is actually exactly what it means like to say that farming is to develop good human beings, like to perfect the human being. It's the, it's the trials and the, you know, figuring out how to deal with these issues that oftentimes somehow parallel with like the spiritual trials within your life. Um, and I was also thinking how important it is that this, um this do nothing form of farming which is not lazy at all but very much is um focused on letting the earth be the earth and figuring out how to have a relationship with the earth how important that way of farming is to helping develop the human being because you can see even separate from farming how important it is to be clear and honest and not manipulative and like you know with yourself in order to grow and so it's the same with a farm you need to treat the the a, a farm like nature and work with with it rather than spraying everything with chemicals and making sure you're getting the numbers of crops that you want like and so it, it was interesting to hear uh, um, everyone comment things and this, yeah, that was basically what was coming to mind, just like how um, the working with the naturalness of the earth and the natural way of, of the earth uh, is very important and how that parallels with working with the natural way of um our spirits 
limits and being clear and honest about things with ourselves so that we can continue to grow because it does take this flow and this this natural yeah sorry I'm just sort of saying the same thing again and again so <laughs> that's where I'll leave it <laughs> nice yeah that's good points good for you awesome awesome stuff I think it was a great book I'm I'm, we're going to um, finish the book discussion now. I'm gonna, just going to say something. And then um, we're going to talk about like any gardening questions you, anybody may, may have. Um, so just to sum up the book, it's a fantastic book. I The first time I read it, I was like, wow, this book is good. This book is everything that I've been preaching forever. And then the second time I read through it, I was looking for the problems. And I didn't really see any. So I went through it a third time, which was the first time last winter, and I thought, I really need to go through that book again and see where the problems are. And I really didn't see any. I mean, I have a different worldview and a different philosophy from the author, so we could debate that stuff. But as far as the way he interacts with the earth and how he grows his crops and pretty much how he interacts with his community – I really liked it, and I thought, man, this is great. This really is the Georgic tradition, and I liked it so much that I just listened to it again. I didn't listen to another book again. I just listened to it twice back and back last winter, and it was like, all right, this is what my class is all about. And I already had my my curriculum done, you know, because I've been doing this a couple of years. But as I was thinking about my curriculum the fourth time I went through this book, I was thinking he's actually touching on pretty much everything in the curriculum and everything in my curriculum is pretty much in that book. I mean, it, it may be hard to find it, but I mean, those, those themes and, and the, those ideas are there. So I think I agree with the author. I mean, in, in a really simple way, I could say a hundred percent, but if we really had a 12 hour discussion, we probably disagree on something. I don't know. But so I loved the book. And, and if you liked the way he was talking about growing food in that book, that is how I will be teaching you to grow your gardens this year. So I see Brindley smiling and I see Mari smiling. So that's that's a good thing. Um, so let's open this up to Q&A. If you have questions about farming, gardening, permaculture, biodynamics, Silvopasture, what is this problem? Why are my plants dying? Anything like that. Um, the politics of gardening, farming, agriculture, corporate agriculture, why foods in restaurants are not what they ought to be. Anything. I have a question. Okay, Zeke, go for it. Thank you. Okay, so um, I am preparing a piece of ground that has been lawn for the last 10 years to be a garden. Yeah. Um, it's pretty good. It stays green most of the year. I think it, it hasn't been tilled or anything basically ever. It's just been mowed and then they've let the grass crippings just decompose there. So it's actually kind of decent. Um, nice. I, because of water concerns, I'm not turning the whole thing just into it. I'm doing rows. And then uh, I, so what I've been doing, and I want to hear if this is a good idea, I went through and dug holes in a grid. And the holes are going to be sunken beds to grow curcubits. Um, okay. And then I've, I'm doing rows of straw on top of those in, in rows, like down just one direction of the grid. And then I'm doing spot watering with drippers that have a controlled drip in each one of those, uh, in each one of those sunken beds in this grid. Um, I was going to amend this for the first year by going through and just and, and also this straw is well rotted it's been rotting for about two years and i was going to amend this by pouring over i have a quality compost and i was going to inoculate from the compost and then use my dust spreader to put diatomaceous earth all over the whole spot is there anything else you would oh, oh and i'm going to be putting fish hydrolysate over it at the recommended le level and some chelated iron that i have is there anything else you would recommend why are you putting on chelated iron? Because the straw does not have any. And I read somewhere that when you're growing in straw your first year, you should put in chelated iron. Okay. Um, are the other plants growing around there, are there any trees close to this? There is one. Well, 
Yes. Yes. Do they have signs of iron chlorosis? I don't know what that is. The leaves turn yellow and you can see the veins in the leaf that are still green. No, that does not happen. Okay, you probably don't need to use the chelated iron. Here's why I'm asking about iron and why that's a red flag to me. If you put on the tiniest bit too much iron, the soil becomes toxic, it kills lots of your microbes, and you... Um, <sighs> I mean, you you may not be able to grow plants there for five years. Oh, that's a good point. Okay, be very, okay. very careful when you're adding iron. There are some, like, you can't even buy it at Walmart or Lowe's or Home Depot. But I know that you shop for this kind of stuff at farm stores. And the reason they're not, they're like a prescription drug almost. And that's why most garden centers don't get it or everybody just kill everything. <laughs> yeah so be very careful with the chelated iron i would go ahead and plant stuff and then see if you have an iron deficiency plant a bunch of strawberries in there they're very susceptible to iron deficiency so that would be a good indicator crop to grow just like i don't know how big your garden is let's say it's um like 20 feet long or whatever put in three strawberry plants they're not going to take anything over but if the leaves start getting yellow you probably have need some iron. It's 80 feet long by by about 70 feet wide. Yeah, we'll put in 20 or 30 strawberry plants just randomly. And the only reason you're growing those is to tell you if you have an iron deficiency. I would rather do that and be a year late on getting the iron in there than putting too much iron in there and causing a toxic problem. Cool. I have one follow-up question. Okay. Um, okay. I am not able to do big composts how I would like to because I don't generate enough scraps for it and I don't want to have to buy stuff to like make compost. Yeah, it makes um, sense. Um, I want my compost to be recycling, not an additional project. Yeah. Um, and so for that, do you think it would be better to, as we get scraps, just piecemeal add them to a pile? cover them in straw or whatever we're using for that and just slowly build up a pile. And then when it gets full, turn it over and yada, yada. Or yeah, so, do you think it'd be better to like have a midden heat? And then uh, what, like, what do you think's the best way to do that kind of a deal? Okay. Why are you making compost? Um, number one thing is to have, uh, I want to seal my loop. I want everything that I produce as waste to go back into the system as valuable uh, to the garden. That's my priority. Okay, so you're not – if that's the reason, then we have to stop calling that compost. We need to have a dictionary so people know what they're saying. What you're saying to seal the loop so that all of your bad – well, not bad stuff, but like kitchen scraps and yeah. whatever, you don't want it to just go in the trash can. You want it to become fertility. Let's call that organic matter or detritus. So okay. just take that material and go put it out there and bury it under your straw. The earthworms are going to eat it up because the bacteria is going to start working on it. Don't worry about having it in a special place you call a compost pile. Okay. Okay. It's just add that detritus. So that brings up the next question, and I'll answer it really quickly. So that what in the world is a compost? A compost is a very technical, scientific way of decomposing specific things so that you can grow a maximum number of beneficial microbes that will create functioning soil where you have soils that are no good. That was a big definition, but that was the shortest way I can say it. I, I have one more slight concern. Okay, go. If I'm putting stuff like eggshells or meat scraps or bone scraps or, you know, just soups that smell like something. I I'm a little bit worried about scavengers because we do have skunks and raccoons and such. And then being in my caged compost, I wasn't that worried about it because, you know, if they dig in there, more power to them. They got to eat too. But if they're going in there and killing off my plants because now they're digging into my garden, Okay, I have your answer. I got your answer. Here it is. What you need is an anaerobic compost. Really? 
and you're going to do exactly what you just said, and it's going to take you about three years to make it. So you just, every day when you have kitchen scraps, you just dump it in this cage. All right? At the end of three years, or when it fills up, and I'm guessing it's going to be a while, then you just kind of take your cage off around it and then knock the top half off. That becomes the bottom of where your new cage is. Put your cage around it, and everything that's from the ground up halfway, use that as a compost. And I could look at it with my microscope and tell you if it's a good inoculant or if it's just a detritosphere. But that solves your problem. Cool. Thank you. Um, sorry for taking up so much time, but I appreciate that's, it. That's fine. We want you to have the best garden of your life, so I want to answer your questions. Okay, we have a person on here I've never seen before, Aaron Hansen. Do you have a question tonight? Um, you're muted. Can you push the button to unmute yourself? We've met. I've been to your farm. I oh, nice. Remind me who you are, because I don't recognize you. I came with I came with Shauna, um, a couple weeks ago. Oh yeah, you were here uh, yeah. two weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. I know you. I talked, I talked about maybe coming out with my seven children and yeah, nice. I hope you figure yeah. that out. I'd love it. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So I, uh, I have grown a garden. I have never gotten much of anything out of it. So, okay. I, I had this huge zucchini plant last, or was it cucumbers? Uh, zucchini. It was a huge zucchini plant. No zucchinis. I mean, like, there were oh, huge okay. leaves. No zucchinis. I think I got like five. Let me ask you a question about that plant real quick. You say it was huge. How tall was it? Was it up to your belly button? Or was it up to your uh, eye? Like, how huge are we talking? At least my belly button. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. That is pretty tall. And how wide did it spread? Like, as far uh, as you can get your hands out, or like twice that big? Probably. I had it in a box. So, probably like. Well, it went cucumber. Like so, probably like, I don't know, would you say like. Six or seven feet. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then, like, it was probably like about five feet deep. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. That's good. That gives me context. Now keep talking. I need to listen to you to know how to help you. Oh. Um. I don't know. Maybe we didn't peck them as much as we should have. Maybe we let the leaves grow too big. I don't know. I don't know. So Maybe you said you didn't get year. any zucchini. You didn't get any fruit. Like, hardly any. We got like five or six. Did you no, have like... one plant or five plants? Uh, one? Oh, no, we had three. Three. Did we have three? I don't know. Okay. I don't remember. So you, you had like one. So you got three zucchinis off of it or you had three plants? Like five or six zucchinis. And... Bronwyn says that we had three plants. You never oh, met nice. Bronwyn. Bronwyn didn't come. She's my third child. Hi. Good to see you. I was the one who watered the garden. She's the one that watered it. Perfect. How big were the zucchinis when you picked them? Well, that's awesome. You're really good at growing giant zucchini plants. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what did you yeah. use for plant food, like fertilizer? I don't know. Uh, did we use plant food? Yeah. Maybe like whatever. like that green bot green you know like little container like that like miracle maybe. grow maybe yeah, yeah something like that okay nice nice okay cool good oh and i also have an apple tree that i planted two years ago and it still hasn't produced an apple okay um did the plant have a lot of flowers on it they get the big mm -hmm. yellow orange the flowers did it have a whole bunch of those or not really no it didn't really flower it's, so I don't know what the problem was, but I'm going to speculate, okay? Mm -hmm. and maybe we can come up with some ideas. Um, if it didn't have a lot of flowers, then it sounds – and the and the leaves were really big. It sounds like you had a lot of nitrogen in the soil and not enough of the other nutrients to create flowering. Okay. So when you get a lot of extra leaf growth and you don't get very many flowers – then you're not going to get very many fruits because the fruit grows after the flower pollinates. 
All okay. right. So there's that. So that could be part of the problem. Um, Is it yeah. could part of the problem be that we don't have pollinators? Because our yes. pumpkins have the same issue. Like we had a good, we had some good pumpkin plants up front. We got yeah. like three pumpkins. Okay. Did it have a lot of flowers on it? Yes. The pumpkins? The, the pumpkins, yeah. So it had like 20 or 30 flowers, you think? No, 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 no. Like six flowers and we got like three pumpkins. Okay. So if, so here's the fun thing about squashes. And and uh, zucchinis and pumpkins are all squashes. We call those mm -hmm. curcubits. In science, mm -hmm. it's called a curcubit. That mm -hmm. includes all the melons, all the squashes, all the pumpkins, all the cucumbers, okay? So here's oh. the thing about curcubits. Some curcubits have boy flowers and girl flowers. Oh. They have to. So you said, oh, yeah, there were like six flowers and then we had three pumpkins. That's perfect. That's the perfect ratio, okay. right? Okay, now, okay. scientifically, that's not the perfect ratio. It's just funny that you said that. And it was a good analogy to, to tell you that there's boys and girls in these flowers. Mm -hmm. So. If you would have had like 20, 30, 50 flowers on that uh, zucchini, which you're thinking you didn't have tons like that, then mm -hmm. I would say you didn't have the right pollinators. Okay. Mm -hmm. But since you only had a few flowers and the plant was really giant, I'm thinking mm -hmm. the plant was putting all of its energy into leaf growth instead of flowers. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is have a more balanced soil. So that was okay. it tells me that something's wrong with your soil. Your soil was not balanced correctly. Okay. So whatever fertilizer you were using probably had more nitrogen in it than it should have had. So you need to probably just plant your plants this year and don't mm -hmm. give that soil plant food. Here's why. Nitrogen oh. will go away. And in farming or, gar or gardening or soil science, we call nutrients going away leaching. So oh. the so the nitrogen will leach away. Have you had a rainstorm since your zucchini was alive? Have you had snow? Yeah. Has there yeah. been water there? Okay, that yeah. will move away. The, it will leach away the nitrogen. So go ahead and plant some things there this year and don't okay. give it any plant food. And there's a good chance that a lot of the nitrogen will have gone away and your uh, and then your plant will be more balanced. Okay. Okay. Now, if you okay. need to guarantee a crop, what you're going to want to do is um, like do a soil test. You can, there's probably places around that do free soil tests. And mm. they like maybe the university or a gardening place, a, a, a nursery, just talk to gardening people around your local area and see if anybody like the, the university, uh, the extension say, service, they, yeah. the extension service often will do free soil tests at certain times of year. Okay. And even if you do, they have to charge you for it. It's like twelve dollars. And that soil test will tell you what you need. OK. Mm. And so if the soil test comes back and it says you need to add nitrogen. I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. and if they say everything looks pretty good, then you're good. But if it says, oh, you have absolutely no calcium, you need to add lots of calcium, then you need to do that because that would be another reason that your plant didn't do well. Because calcium in the soil helps all the other 40-something nutrients that the plant needs to absorb into the plant. Without calcium, you can't absorb other things. But it was obviously absorbing a lot because you grew a giant plant. So your soil has a lot of nutrients. That's why I'm saying you might be a really okay to just plant another garden, and you'll probably okay. get some things this year. But don't okay. give it nitrogen fertilizer. Okay. So that's my quick answer without actually seeing your garden and testing your soil. Okay. How I mean, about I my test well, your soil? I. I I charge 150 for the soil test that I do. Okay. So, so without of like, so it's more appropriate for somebody with a larger, a larger garden or a farm. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So instead of a garden box or or a, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. 
I, any any thoughts on my apple tree that is not producing apples? Uh, yeah. Um, are there other apple trees in the vicinity when it blooms? Nope. Okay, that's your problem. You don't have any pollinators. Oh, okay. You need a neighbor down the street. And then the bees need to fly back and forth and trade pollen. So you need to plant another apple tree in your... Does it have flowers? Does it come with flowers in the spring? Okay. I mean, because okay. if it is covered with flowers, then great. It, it's it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a single woman who wants to have a baby, but she's not married and she can't have a baby. That's what's happening to your apple tree. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. By the way, if you want to plant an apple tree for good pollination, get a crab apple. Because oh, okay. they're so prolific with blooms, and they st and they bloom for so long that it will probably bloom at the same time. So let's say you have an apple tree, and it's a, uh, your apple tree. Let's just pretend that it's a red delicious. I don't know why I picked that one because there's so many better varieties. But let's pretend that's what it is. And let's say that it opens for – and the flowers are open for two weeks in, in the, in, at the end of April. And you say, oh, I have a red delicious. Let's get a, a yellow delicious, and then they can cross-pollinate. What if the red delicious you get, their flowers open in middle middle of May? It's a problem. The flowers have to open at the same time to cross pollinate. Okay. okay? That's okay. why I say a crab apple, because they start blooming early and they have flowers on them for a month and a half. And so they will be open when all your other varieties are open. Okay. Um, what do you do with crab apples? You make pectin out of them so that you can make jelly okay and you okay. smell the blossoms while they're blooming <laughs> okay <laughs> okay 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 any other garden questions tonight all right we have a 10 second rule here if you don't speak i stop this so <laughs> okay thank you for being on tonight it was super fun um, just remember that this was brought to you by survivalgardenseeds.com. Go there to find all your fantastic heirloom seeds. And if you need any questions asked, Thursday nights are the time to ask them right here. Next week, same link, same time, different book. The book discussion will be As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. And you can listen to it on, on Audible fast. It's like one or two hours, depending on how fast you listen to it. So good night, and we will see you guys later. Thank you. You are welcome.